Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope everybody's doing well as we approach the very end of the semester. Um, things get really busy the next couple of class periods. Um, we're wrapping it all up. I know that uh, this might cause some people some stress. If you find that anything's on your mind or you're having trouble, please reach out to me. We'll do what we can to help you out. Um, these are the last two PowerPoints that I have that deal with reading strategies. Um, I'm going to go through them both. One's real short, so don't panic. Uh, and the other one is going to be really important for that reading test that we have at the end of the semester. Um, I will try to remember to put all of these on Blackboard. I have kind of not lived up to that promise at this point, so I'm going to try to remember to do that right after I complete these two slideshows. Um, but if I'm not and you're looking for them, shoot me an email, and I will definitely upload those rather quickly. Okay, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about argument. This is going to be the, the short presentation. Um, I've spoken about a lot of this stuff, but again, just to kind of reinforce some themes that we've talked about as we get into this argumentative essay. I think it'll be a good job, just to, or a good idea to go over this one real quick. All right, so you've heard me use uh, these terms, or at least the term claim, a lot. Uh, I've used them kind of synonymously with topic sentence. Um, so just kind of have a slide to put that in front of you again. I think it's a good idea. Um, but the author's claim is the main point of the argument, okay? Or a main point of an argument. I like that idea better, a main point of the argument. An argument is, is made up of several claims, all right? If you can prove those claims and those claims logically follow the thesis statement, then you're building a case. When we were looking at the example essay about lowering the drinking age. I kind of went through and tried to examine each of those claims one by one. All right, she was arguing that we need to keep the drinking age to 21. She made a claim that teenagers are reckless and irresponsible. And I asked you to think, do you have support to back that up? Do you know irresponsible people who have drunk and done stupid things between the ages of 18 and 21? Um, if you do, then you're providing some evidence, some reasons to support that claim. Okay, so the body paragraph is filled with support, reasons to believe this point. Um, she made the claim that drinking at a young age is dangerous. Okay, and she provided some evidence for that. She made the third claim that America as a culture engages in certain behaviors that make drinking at a young age not so great. Okay. Um, she said that we're competitive. She said that we want what we want as much as we can get. We tend to binge drink. Um, you know, again, if she can support each of these claims, okay, um, and all those claims work together, then presumably you're more willing to buy into the argument, at least if you have kind of a, an open mind, which is how we said you want to approach an audience when writing these types of essays. Okay, so here's the claim. Gladiator is a movie worth seeing. Okay, and then of course you've got some support. 12 Oscars, 1-5. Uh, it deals with themes that most people tend to like. It's got nonstop action. Okay, um, so this is all support for this argument, right, that it's worth seeing. Okay, this could be a thesis statement and these could be body paragraphs. Um, this could be a topic sentence uh, that supports a larger argument about Gladiator, okay? As you get into 101 and you have to start expanding five pages, 10 pages, 20 pages, um, rather than just doing the five paragraph essay, you ask yourself, well, how many claims do I have? How many do I need to prove in order to defend this idea? Okay, all right, so what we have here is this, uh, three statements. One is a claim and to our support for the claim. I'll give everybody a second just to read through those and then see if you can figure out which one is the claim and which to our support. I'm going to move on. If you need a few extra seconds, please feel free to pause it and then read what we have here. Okay, working long hours on the computer should be avoided. That's the claim. Okay, this is what the author is trying to prove. Okay, um, as evidence, uh, we have eye strain, um, blurred vision, sensitivity to light. Okay, so these are all reasons for the claim. All right. Now, we've been talking all semester about unity. 
All right, making sure that every sentence in a body paragraph supports the topic sentence. Making sure that every body paragraph supports the thesis. Okay, so what you want to do is look at the evidence for the claims and make sure that each one of them proves it. Okay, online shopping offers a lot of benefits. Okay, there's four statements there. Decide whether each one is relevant or not relevant. Okay, you can shop anytime. You don't have to leave home. You can't try clothes on to see if they fit. You have to pay postage for return items. Okay, I'll give you a second. Figure out which one of these are relevant, that support the claim, and which ones do not. Okay, all four deal with online shopping, but the topic sentence is benefits, right? The first two, shop any time, don't leave home, benefits. Okay, uh, the last two, they're related to online shopping, but they don't prove the topic sentence, the claim that it offers a lot of benefits. Um, not being able to try clothes on, not a benefit. Uh, paying postage, not a benefit. This one's particularly apropos given our situation lately, huh? Hmm. Okay. All right, the other thing you have to worry about is do you have enough support? All right. Um, a vegetarian diet is more... Is a more health, healthful diet. I feel much better since I became a vegetarian. Okay, great. There may be a host of other reasons why you feel better. Okay, um, so you, you can use some anecdotes to start to give some support, but I'm not just going to believe something just because you say it's the case. All right, so on 101, the more support you can provide, the more evidence you can use to build your case, the better. All right. All right, so here's an example of some pretty good support, okay? Muscles burn more calories than fat, okay? Now we've got some scientific evidence to back that up. Um, of course, you're going to have to cite that. We've talked about citing sources, or you may be about to watch a video on citing sources, um, so make sure that you, you know, explain where you got this information from. All right, like I said, we're almost done, almost done with this slideshow. It's just kind of reinforcing things that we've been talking about with arguments and argumentative essays. I, I do have something else coming after this, so don't get excited and think that you're going to be done in another two seconds. Um, okay, and this just says that, you know, textbooks use a lot of evidence from, from professionals and scholars and, you know, scientists and doctors and things like that, Okay. Um, you're going to want to do the same thing as you continue to build your cases. Use sources from verified experts to kind of lend credence to what you have to say. Um, it also makes you look more credible because you've done the legwork, right? You've, you've looked things up um, and, and, and done the research rather than just saying, like, well, I, I feel this way because I always have. Okay? All right, so that was just a, a real quick look at argumentation. Hopefully it reinforced some things that uh, we've been talking about with the argumentative essay. Really what's important today is inferences. Okay? The reading and writing test that you're going to take is right around the corner. I think I have to spend some time today or tomorrow really figuring out what that's going to look like. I'll have to reach out to some people on campus and see what I can do about that. Um, but whatever I do, you're going to have to take a reading and writing test. Um, it will be worth 10% of your grade. Not a threat, but just a reminder, everybody's going to be allowed to take that test. It's worth 10%. If you have not done at least, I think I bumped that there. If you have not done at least 70% on Connect, I will allow you to take the test, but I will not be counting that. All right, so you potentially lose 20% of your grade. So this is one of the final times I get to warn you, if you're not caught up in Connect, you need to get going on that right now. Okay. Um, there will be a lot of questions on this test, presumably, that ask you to draw inferences. Okay. Not what's written down on the page, but what can you infer from the page. Okay. Let's see if this next slide defines inferences. I hope it does. Okay. An inference or conclusion is an idea that is suggested by the facts or details in a passage. Okay. A valid inference is a logical conclusion based on the evidence. Okay. So, you might read a passage that's not going to tell you um, what you're looking for, but it's going to hint at what you're looking for. And you've got to draw conclusions based on the evidence there. 
Okay, so make sure you can see that there. Um, so the question here, what are the emotions shown in this picture? Okay, everybody can see that here, the little graduate. You've got the two people around it, uh, around him it looks like. Um, what can you, what emotions do you see here? Okay, I'll give you a second to kind of think. Okay, so some people in class um, have said that there's, there's a lot of pride and joy, okay? Um, and as evidence for their inference, they said, well, everybody's very close, everybody's got their arms around them, um, you know, dad is smiling, looks like all three of them are smiling, so that's great. Um, there's these kind of like lines above their heads which might show a happy emotion, okay? Um, I've had other people say that uh, there's some surprise, especially from the father. This is presumably the father, I would say. Um, he's kind of, there's kind of some separation between him and his son. You know, kind of like he's cocking his head back, like, I can't believe you did this. Um, and those lines kind of emanating from the head might, you know, show like shock. Like, oh my gosh, you actually graduated. Okay. Um, just, a, just an aside here. Um, if you haven't spent time, especially with graduation coming up, picturing yourself in the near future walking across that aisle with that cap and gown, I encourage you to do so. Um, they say that people who succeed in life picture where they want to be in the future um, and work towards that. So presumably all of you are working towards a two-year degree and hopefully moving on past that. So, you know, especially as we get closer to a graduation that may or may not be canceled, I don't know. My son is supposed to walk down the, well, you know, walk across the stage. I hope, I hope they still are able to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, spend some time picturing how your family is going to feel when, when you're handed that diploma, who's going to be in attendance, how you're going to feel. Uh, it'll help you kind of stay motivated as you kind of finish your academic journey here at Triton and hopefully move on. Okay, back to inferences. Okay. All right, so... Like I said, on this test, you will be given passages, and they will ask you, what can you infer from the information that's being provided? Okay, um, So a couple things we want to talk about. We want to base our inferences on what's actually there, Okay, not on opinion and biases. So you will have plenty of time on this test. It will not be timed. So spend some time thinking through these things and asking yourself, am I, am I finding evidence of that in the text or am I bringing something to the text? Um, an effective reader's goal is to find out what the author is saying, stating, or implying. Okay? An invalid conclusion is a false inference that is not based on details or facts in the text or on reasonable thinking. Okay? So we're going to look at a method that they um, suggest to kind of avoid this. Okay? Verify and value the facts. Assess prior knowledge, okay? We've talked about a good reader brings to the text um, stuff that he or she has already learned before. Okay. Learn from the text, investigate for bias, detect contradictions, okay? So this is going to be a more time-consuming process than just reading and looking for an answer. Um, so slow down, kind of look at what's on the paper, um, and then kind of run through this process so that you're not led to something that isn't correct in the answer. Okay, so verify and value the facts. All right, I'm going to read this and then we're going to see what we can ascertain in terms of inferences. Okay, Korea has long been known as the eastern land of courtesy. When happy, a Korean simply smiles or gently touches the one who brings the happiness. When angry, a Korean simply stares directly at the person and that humble and that person's humble smile is a powerful apology. Okay, so we're looking for some valid inferences. All right, there are three choices. Read each one and ask yourself, can we conclude or assume any of these three statements based on what we've just read? Okay, um, Koreans are quiet and reserved people. Okay, do we know that or can we infer that based on what we've read? Koreans show their emotions. Koreans are afraid of hurting the feelings of other people. Okay, so which one of those can we infer? Which one of those can we not infer? I'll give everybody a, a few seconds to kind of contemplate on that before I move on. 
if you need to go ahead and go back and reread the section, that's an effective test taking technique. Um, feel free to pause if you want to, to, to do so without me talking all over. And on the test, feel free to, to flip back and forth, you know, read, read the text, check each one, see what you need to do. It's not timed, take your time. I can't tell you how many times I've sat out in that hall waiting for people to come out from the test, and they come out after like 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and they always tell me they did a really good job, and then when I get the results, they have not done a very good job. So take your time. I'm going to move on. If you need to pause right now, go ahead. Okay. So we can infer one and two. Okay. Koreans are quiet and reserved people. Okay. Um, you know, when angry, a Korean simply stares in the direction of the person. Okay. That shows me that they're pretty quiet and reserved people. When I'm angry, I tend to be a little more vocal. Okay. Some people might have been inclined to not choose two. Um, it's the case that maybe they don't, Koreans don't show their emotions the same way other people from other races do, but they definitely show their emotions, right? Um, if they're angry, they stare at a person, okay? Um, when they're happy, they smile or gently touch a person. They, they may not be as emotive as some other cultures, but they do show their emotions. Um, but we can infer number three. Koreans are afraid of hurting the feelings of other people. It says right here that um, they stare directly, you know, at the person. You know, they're, not af they're not afraid of conveying their emotions. They just do it differently. Okay. Hopefully you guys got that right. Okay. Okay. So what can be inferred from the picture? Uh, the baseball player feels angry. The baseball player feels triumphant. The baseball player feels defeated. Okay. Hopefully you guys chose number two, uh, triumphant. Okay. Um, we can see the big smile on her face. doesn't look like she's angry or defeated. Um, so we can go to some textual evidence to support the idea that maybe she feels triumphant. I once had somebody say that she looks kind of uh, demonic. Okay, she's raising the bat over her head or over her shoulders. So she's going to smash something. I don't know that it's raised high enough to to support that. And she, you know, she's choked up quite a bit. She doesn't look like she's ready to bash anybody's brains in. Okay. Assess prior knowledge. What do you already know? What are you bringing to the text? Okay. This is why effective readers read a lot. Because the more you read, the more you know, the more you're able to bring to the text. Which is why I've said since the very beginning, the best thing you can do for this class is read. Read, read, read. I don't know what the summer's going to look like for any of us. Um, but if we're kind of limited in where we can go and what we can do, but the libraries are open... Get a book, get a magazine, get a subscription, go online, read as much as you can. Studies show that the more people read, the more successful they do academically. Okay. okay. Um, I forgot to make a backup copy of my brain. So everything I learned last summer was lost. What is being compared? Okay. I, I, I've done this in the past and people have had trouble answering this. Um, The choices are compared to a computer, compared to a friend, compared to what he knows. So think a second, what is your answer? Okay, and the answer hopefully that you landed upon was that you're being compared to a computer. Okay, um, geez, as if it wasn't easy enough with that. <laughs> um, but a backup copy of my brain. Um, so we don't back up friends, we don't back up what we know, right? They're making a, a comparison to a computer, right? Um, so you have worked with computers, you've made backup copies of things, hopefully. Um, so hopefully you can bring in past knowledge of your experience with computers to understand that analogy. Okay. Look for context clues. Okay. I've, I've said many times in class before we got sent home, uh, that one good way to pass a test is to use the test, okay? In every test, except maybe math, um, there are clues, questions that will help you answer other questions, the ways that you can use the text to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, so use the context clues. What, what, what do we see in the vocabulary that helps us out? Okay. Nikki is not her usual docile self when she is playing basketball. 
She has more fouls called on her for unnecessary roughness than any of her teammates. Docile means, okay, ooh, ooh, you know, I've never heard that word before. Um, so I've got to, I've got to, I've got to figure out what that means. All right. Uh, our choices are bold, meek, or brave. Okay. So usually she's docile. All right. Um, but when she's playing basketball, she has more fouls called on her. Um, so we can kind of figure out that docile means what. All right, and again, hopefully you chose B, meek, okay? When she's on the court, she's bold, she's brave, right? She's throwing elbows all around. Meek means the opposite. Meek means um, quiet, um, unassuming, right? So we can use the context clues, right? The, the second sentence talks about what she's like on the basketball court. We know that that's not how she usually is. So we can infer that meek means kind of quiet and unassuming. All right, step four is investigating bias, all right? This is, this is a, a, a tricky tightrope to watch, or to walk, rather. You want to use your prior knowledge and bring what you know to the text, but you also don't want to let your assumptions guide you to places that it shouldn't, okay? Um, so if you have biases, right, test them against the words, okay? If, if, you, if you believe something about Korean people, um, you know, going back to the example we used before, um, stop and examine that and say, well, is this, does the text support this idea? Maybe I think that Korean people are not emotional. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing that to the, to the forefront. Um, and then I'm going to have that bias reinforced in that passage because they're not very loud. They're not very outspoken, according to the, according to the post. But if I truly stop and examine it, I see that, well, no, these people are showing their emotions. They're just doing so in a, in a different way, okay? So I'm not going to get led to a wrong answer just because of what I, I think the answer should be. I'm going to use the text itself to get me to my answers. Okay, okay. this is an interesting example. Detect contradictions. Okay, uh, An effective reader hunts for the most reasonable explanation for something. I believe Sherlock Holmes once said, if you rule out all of the things that are impossible, then all you're left with are... Uh, I forget the quote. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all you're left with is what that which must be true or something. Um, Okay, so the best way to do this is consider other explanations that could logically contradict your first impression. Okay, all right, so we're looking at this gentleman, okay? Um, and then we're gonna look at these behaviors and we're gonna see what explanation probably makes the most sense, okay? So we're gonna take him in connection with him, or with these, okay? So this gentleman here has slurred words, poor balance, slow movement, Fatigue or tiredness. Okay? So, you're in the office, you're working with this guy. Okay? Um, he's got slurred words, poor balance, slow movement, fatigue or tiredness. Okay? Now, what do you think the most reasonable explanation is here? Right, and this has always led to some really powerful discussion. Um, I wish that I could be in class to, to have it with you guys. How many of you thought that maybe he's drunk or on drugs? Okay. I've had people suggest that in class. Other people have stopped and said, well, hold on a second. Like, I, I want to detect some contradictions, right? This guy right here, his eyes aren't bloodshot. He's very well-dressed. Um, he looks very professional. He doesn't look the way he's presented in this picture, like the type of guy who would be in the office drunk, right? So a more logical explanation might be that um, he's having sort of some sort of medical problem, right? He's having a stroke, um, you know, a, a heart attack, right? So he may have taken some medication that um, is affecting him in some way. Hold on one second. Let me hit the other computer here. Get the light back up. There we go. Um, 
you know, if, if you take these alone, slurred word, poor balance, slow movement, fatigue or tiredness, I might absolutely think alcohol, <laughs> okay? Um, when I look at the picture along with those things, I look at him and I think to myself, he doesn't look like somebody who would be on a bender on a Wednesday morning. Um, so then, you know, if I'm in the office, I'm not instantly going to accuse him of being an alcoholic. I'm probably going to give him a test and see if he needs uh, some medical help because this guy, poor guy may be having a stroke or something. Okay, so that's what we mean about like detecting contradictions. Like these and this together don't look like they match. At least if I'm looking for like some sort of alcohol problem, um, I might I might be ready to call the hospital rather. Okay. All right. Um, there are two terms that you might want to throw in your notes at this point. Um, yeah, and one is connotation, and one is denotation, okay? Um, these are really important literary terms, and these can help you kind of with some inferences. Okay, denotation, all right, um, which is just like this word with a D-E instead of a C-O. Denotation is the dictionary definition of a word, okay? We can all agree upon this, all right? Um, so, mother, the word mother, okay? The denotation of mother is your female biological predecessor, okay? I don't know if that's exactly what the dictionary says, but I'm providing a definition, right? Uh, a mother is a female biological predecessor, okay? Now, the connotation is all the emotional baggage a word brings with it, all right? Um, certain words are emotionally charged, right? They carry with them certain, I was about to use the word connotation, uh, certain feelings and emotions, right, that, that may differ from person to person. Um, so unpacking the inferences of words, or unpacking the connotations of words may help you infer different things. Okay, so if I'm looking at this sentence, my home is for sale. The word that you, you might want to focus on there is home. Okay, um, now there's nothing in those one, two, three, four, five words that necessarily expresses how the author feels about that. It's just a fact, right? Um, however, we might see that there's a, a tinge of sadness there, right? Um, because the word home. Right? And now if, if the sentence says, my house is for sale, um, it's a different sentence. It expresses the same thing, but my house is for sale, house is a little more informal, a little more removed. Home has some connotations of, man, the place where my kids grew up, the place where um, the, the first place my wife and I shared together. Um, so home has connotations that change the meaning emotionally than maybe home. Okay. Um, I, used the, I used the word mother earlier. Um, so, mom, mommy, mama, mother. Okay. All those words mean the same thing. Denotations? De all those words denote the same person. But which you choose has different connotations, right? My mom is mad at me. Mom seems more kind of removed, right? Um, my mommy's mad at me. Now there's there's a bit more informality there. Um, you may be expressing different things, right? Um, if you're angry with that person, you might say, you know, like, hey, she says, yeah, clean your room. And you say, yes, mother. Um, yes, mom. Okay. Means the same thing, but mother might have the connotation of anger, right? Because you're not calling her by a more informal name. So, so being aware of, of certain words and kind of the emotional baggage they bring in, if you're reading a passage, can help understand the author's hidden meanings a little bit. Okay, okay. some other literary techniques that you might look for. Um, metaphors. Okay, uh, metaphor is a, is a direct comparison. Um, you might also hear the word simile, which is a, a comparison that uses the word like or as. Okay, lies are like sinkholes. Okay, so that sentence, if you're using a metaphor or a simile, lies are like sinkholes, um, it, 
it invites you to kind of analyze what the author is saying. Well, lies are like sinkholes. What, what does that mean? What is a sinkhole? It's something that, like quicksand, right? You, you step in and it sucks you down um, and there's no escape. And, and the more you spend time in quicksand or a sinkhole, the, the further down you, you fall. Okay, so that metaphor is inviting you to understand that once you start telling a lie, um, it's harder and harder to get out of, and it drags you down more and more and more. Okay, um, there's also personification. Okay, where you give human traits to things that are not human. Okay, so the sun woke slowly. We know we know that the sun doesn't wake; it just we circle around it, right? But you're personifying the sun. You're making it seem like it's a human thing, um, and so. You, a good reader is going to ask why and what the author gains by making that comparison. Okay. Okay, so we just, on this slide, are talking about metaphors, okay, which is a direct comparison, um, and then we just talked also about simile. Okay, lies are like sticky webs. The only difference between a simile and a metaphor is uh, simile uses the word like, like or as. Okay, um, so same thing. Lies are like sticky webs. W what does that mean? Lies are just words. How can they stick to you? Um, but the author is inviting you to consider how once you tell a lie, um, they stick to you and you can't you can't escape them. Okay. Um, and then of course we we know a lot about symbols, right? Um, something that stands for it suggests something else. Okay. Um, so we can look for those in literature and try to discern why the author is making using usually a, a physical thing to represent some sort of abstract thing, okay? Um, so this is a symbol for death. I always use in my 103 class an example, because um, I, I think we do use a lot of symbols in our everyday lives. In fact, uh, probably the, the, the biggest arguments I've ever gotten in with my wife had to do with things that represented other things, right? Um, but I'll give an example. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that almost all of you right now are wearing some sort of jewelry, right? An earring, a necklace, a, a ring, something. Um, I always pick on a female in class to do this experiment with. Um, so if, there, if there's some female out there who's wearing an earring or a bracelet or a necklace or a ring, something, um, we try a little experiment. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to take off Let's say you have a necklace. I'm going to ask you to take off a necklace and not wear it for two days. Um, and in the same vein, because, you know, class unity and support, I, I want to support you guys. I'm also going to take off a piece of jewelry. Let me show you. Um, so here's uh, this ring that I wear on my left hand on this finger. So I'm just going to take this piece of jewelry off. You can see it here. And I'm not going to wear it for two days. Um, now, if my wife asks me, I'm just going to tell her that uh, I made a deal with another girl I know that we're both not going to wear this piece of jewelry uh, for two, you know, for a while. Okay. Um, if you are a keen observer and you understand the symbolism, you know that I probably won't be posting any more videos because my wife is likely to bash my skull in uh, as soon as I tell her this. Um, Again, it's it's this ring right here and this finger of my left hand. <clears throat> now, as she's attacking me, I'm just going to say, hey, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. It's just a piece of jewelry. Um, me and this girl decided, you know, not to wear these, these two pieces of jewelry. Um, of course, the reason she'll kill me is because my, my piece of jewelry, um, my wedding ring, is symbolic, right? It, it stands for something else, something abstract. Um, the, our relationship, our marriage, the love we share for each other. Um, I, I can't make a valid argument that it's the same thing because your necklace that you took off may not represent the same thing as, as my wedding ring, okay? Um, so it's, it's a good kind of illustration of symbolism. Okay, um, right? So just keep an eye out for words that create mental pictures. Um, right. Gene's skin was pale and hot to the touch. He squeezed his eyes tight against the throbbing in his head, and as he lifted his fingers to press on his temple, his stomach lurked with nausea. Okay. 
And so we can picture this, right? We can, we can imagine him doing this, right? It never says anywhere in this thing that Jean is sick, okay? However, pale, hot to the touch, right? His head is throbbing. He's pressing against his temple. He's leaning forward. Um, he's nauseous, okay? So it's, all of it's creating a picture for us. Um, so we can use all those context clues, use everything we've been talking about to determine that he is sick, okay? Avoid bias, okay? Nauseous, he's pressing his temples to his head, it's throbbing. Okay, maybe I think he's hung over, right? But I have to use all the clues. Pale and hot to the touch won't necessarily result from a hangover. It might more clearly result in being sick. Okay, um, last thing, and I don't know that there'll be any of these on the test, but in textbooks, definitely. Um, they're not wasting space. Anytime they give you a graph or a chart or a picture, they're trying to convey something to you, okay? So you want to stop and you want to you know, think about those and think what they might infer, okay? Um, so I'll give you guys a second so you can look at these three things. What might they mean? Okay, well, this one um, is probably a word that we're very familiar with these days, um, right? Your computer has a virus, right? Um, I don't know if you can see that there's a keyboard there, sorry. There we go. Um, but yeah, the keyboard's sitting there, the computer's sitting there. He's, you know, got a fever, obviously. He's trained to lower his temperature, so you've got a computer virus here. Okay, uh, I'm looking at success or rising stocks or something, right? Something's going up and the years are getting better um, as things go along. And then, of course, this one here is a, an expression. I've got the cat by the tail. Okay, so consider why those pictures are included in whatever you're reading and use those to discern some meaning. Okay, and then, of course, we've got the chapter review. Once again, I'm going to try to remember right now to put all of these online so that they're available for everybody. Um, if you go back to look and you find that they are not there, please don't hesitate to uh, shoot me an email and I'll get them up right away. Okay. That is all I have on reading strategies uh, for this course. There will be no more videos or PowerPoints on reading strategy. So this may be the last time I talk to you about reading before the reading test. Go back and review these if you need to. Um, you can take practice tests online. If you just Google practice AccuPlacer test, um, you know, practice reading AccuPlacer test, I invite you to check some of those out. We were doing one of those in class one day. Take your time. Read carefully. The test will not be timed. So you can spend as much time as you need working on those things. So please, I invite you. Don't rush through it. You know, this is part of your grade, you want to succeed. So when the test is given, um, then take your time, do what you need to do, um, and then earn the grade that you want to grade, or earn the grade that you want to receive, okay? Uh, of course, if you ever have any questions, shoot me an email. I hope that everybody is doing well. I miss you guys, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.